I'd like to look this morning and for the next couple Sundays at what I believe is one of the most intriguing characters of the New Testament, Thomas. Now, many of us learned the 12 disciples, but if I were to ask you on the spot to name all 12, that might be a challenge for, for many of us here today. But my guess is that if you were to start listing the disciples of Jesus, one of those you would remember is Thomas. And when I say Thomas, what do you think of? Almost universal acclaim. Thomas is remembered as Doubting Thomas. And we will look at Thomas as he is presented to us in Scripture. And it's unfortunate that he's remembered as Doubting Thomas. Not necessarily the most flattering way to be remembered <laughs> down through history. But there is so much, I think, that is in Thomas that speaks to you and to me. I've always had this interesting fascination with Thomas. And more so than any other of the disciples except Peter, James, and John, and I guess you could say Judas, we see an insight into Thomas more than all the other disciples other than the ones I mentioned. Now, I should say that in the first three Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Thomas is only mentioned. And he's only mentioned in the list of the other disciples. So other than his name, we, we don't see him in those first three Gospels. And actually, I should clarify that we're not even sure of his name. Because in the Gospels, when he is listed, including here in John, he's referred to by his Greek name, Didymus, which means the twin, and actually, Thomas in Aramaic also means twin. So Thomas is only identified by the fact that he was a twin. We don't know who his brother or sister was, although there's been some fascinating speculation among biblical scholars who that might be, because he's always referred to as the twin. But we don't even really know his given name. But he is forever remembered as Thomas or Didymus, the twin. As I mentioned, he just has this brief reference in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But in John, the camera focuses on Thomas for three different scenes in the gospel. I think it's interesting that John, who was himself a disciple, saw several facets about his companion, that the Holy Spirit deemed important to record for history on the pages of Scripture. And the first time the camera focuses on the twin is here in the 11th chapter of John. When Jesus receives word that Lazarus, his beloved friend, is very ill, Jesus and his disciples are most likely engaged in ministry in the region of Perea, which is on the east side of the River Jordan, about 20 miles northeast of Judea. That was the region where Jerusalem was the holy city, and two miles outside of Jerusalem in Judea was the little village of Bethany, where Lazarus and his sisters lived. Now, Judea was about a 20-mile walk from Perea. So it was a full day's, a long day's journey for Jesus and his disciples to go back to Judea from where they were east of the Jordan. But far more daunting than just the geography was the fact that we see here in the scriptures that when Jesus says, let's go back to Judea, the disciples immediately say, what is he talking about? And they remind Jesus that when he was previously in Judea, in Jerusalem, the Jewish religious leaders had, had so hated Jesus that they tried to stone him to death. So throughout Judea, you can imagine, at least among the Jewish religious authorities, Jesus was on the top of their most wanted list. Going back to Judea, where Bethany was, was risky business. 
And so when Jesus says, we're going to go, can you imagine the looks of the disciples? And as he often seems to do, Thomas is one not hesitant to speak up. And he says this one phrase, let us go that we might also die with him. Now it's hard to really know what the emotion was behind what Thomas was saying. We could possibly hear this as a statement of bravado. As everyone's sitting there knowing the elephant in the room that we're heading back to the area where Jesus is most likely going to die and we could die with him, Thomas is the one to rally his brothers and say, let us then go so that we might die with him. All for one, one for all. Remember, we're all in this together. Let's do this thing. Maybe we could read it that way. But interestingly, perhaps because of the overall picture of Thomas that we see in the Gospel of John, most commentators in this text clearly hear a pessimism in Thomas's voice. John Claypool is one who said this, these words have a bitter fatalistic ring to them. The spirit here seems to be more one of exasperation and despair rather than deep commitment and companionship. Thomas was not saying, I see what you're attempting and dangerous as it is, I want to risk it with you. No, says Claypool, he rather seems to have been saying, this whole thing is suicidal. Nothing good could possibly come of it. We might as well face facts. This movement has had it. Let's resign ourselves to the worst. And I think it is fair to read into this, this, this fatalism, this pessimism, this, this quality that has really helped Thomas to become the Eeyore of the Bible. You remember Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh? He's the character who always is seeing the glass half empty. He's always imagining what could go wrong. I found some fun tests online that we can take to determine which of the Winnie the Pooh characters we best represent in our life. <laughs> Not that I've ever spent the time to actually take that test, and part of why is because I kind of know where I'd come out on that, on that list, at least on many days. Now, I know there's some of you who may see yourself as Tigger, always bouncing around, always excited, always always ready to jump into the action with both feet, even if it's a little reckless in the process. But how many of us really see ourselves like lovable Eeyore, who is always wondering what's going to go wrong? You know, I think a lot of us see tendencies of Thomas and his pessimism in ourselves? How many of us often live according to Murphy's Law? I sure often see this attitude in myself. And I think many of us have a tendency to live life with this attitude of maybe wanting the best, but kind of expecting it'll never really happen for me. Or maybe you're just always expecting the worst. We see this a lot in the world of sports. Now, I'm not a huge hockey fan, but every spring, I, I tend to come back and root for my hometown hockey team, the Washington Capitals. And if any of you follow hockey, you know that the Washington Capitals are probably the most cursed franchise in all of the National Hockey League when it comes to the playoffs. They routinely have amazing regular seasons. They've won the President's Trophy many times for having the most victories during the regular season, but then they always lay an egg in the playoffs, particularly when it comes at the hands of their arch nemesis, the Pittsburgh Penguins, who, alas, they are playing again this year in the second round of the playoffs. And in typical fashion, they went down three games to one. Now, um, in game 
four, when they went down three games to one, the deciding goal, typical Washington Capitals fashion, one of their own players' skates kicked the puck into their own net. That was the deciding goal. So game five comes around last night. I, as a typical Washington Capitals fan, decided to go to bed confident that I'd wake up in the morning knowing it was over. They were eliminated from the playoffs. And I was pleasantly surprised that actually they won last night to extend the torture. So game six is just setting me up for, for some heartbreak. And a lot of you know this. I mean, if, if some of you guys were Red Sox fans before they started winning, I mean, you remember just feeling cursed. Cubs fans, those of you that were Red Sox fans, you will remember, I'm sure, even though your heart was crushed in the World Series back in 1986, I bet you weren't surprised when the ball went through Bill Buckner's legs. Because that was just sort of the, the feeling you had as a, as a fan of these teams that are just constantly letting you down. And we can have fun with that in sports, even though it does kind of eat us up inside. But when it comes to larger scope of life, how many of the major decisions we face, how many of the, the, the days we wake up and we just are afraid to live into that day because maybe things have not always turned out the way we've hoped they would turn out. And we try to develop this, this shell of pessimism that really can cripple and paralyze the way we live. Most of us probably aspire to be the person who sees the glass half full rather than the glass half empty. And who doesn't like to hang around someone who is an optimist? I mean, pessimists are those people that you just kind of, they drag you down to. And, and research shows that a pessimistic attitude is hazardous to your health. One study I saw by the University of Pittsburgh a few years ago showed that over long term, people who have a pessimistic attitude, they are at the same risk of cardiovascular disease as someone with chronic high blood pressure. Now who knows how Thomas became such a pessimist. Maybe he just came out of the womb with a naturally cautious personality. And the world needs people who are cautious and prudent and sober-minded. But the problem is that a tendency to being practical can easily cross the line into being pessimistic. Maybe Thomas learned negative thought patterns and hopelessness from his family of origin. Maybe Thomas was influenced by the first century Greek philosophy of Stoicism, which was very popular in the world of Jesus. It was the idea that you shouldn't get too excited about things. Don't become too passionate about things. And this stoicism has continued to filter into modern life. I mean, think about, I'm painting with a broad brush here, but the, the British keep a stiff upper lip, or, or some of the Scandinavian cultures where you keep everything very close to your vest. Maybe for Thomas, life had been tough. Maybe he had learned to cope, like so many of us, by just expecting the worst. Or maybe he had simply come to the observation that the gloomy predictions of pessimists more often than not come true. Even if the optimists have more fun along the way, Thomas may have drawn the conclusion that in the end, pessimists are more often right. Well, hear me, that pessimism is not just an unfortunate and innocuous personality quirk. Ultimately, pessimism holds us back from moving forward in positive and potentially life-giving ways. And from a faith perspective, pessimism and despair and always looking on the, on the dark side of things it runs counter to the biblical truth that God is working for good in all things for those who love him. And over and over again, God speaks to us in his word. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Now, as I've admitted, this remains a growing area for me 
in my walk with Jesus. My experience with others tells me I'm not alone. And it's interesting, our first picture of the disciple Thomas in John's Gospel reminds us that even one of the Savior's closest friends and followers, one who had walked closely with him during three years of ministry, seeing firsthand the miracles Jesus did, listening up close to his teaching of such authority, observing on a day-to-day -day basis the strength and the serenity of his master, even Thomas was still learning how to follow Jesus in the face of fear and to let go of the natural tendency to worry about what might happen. And it's important to note that Thomas was not considered any less of a disciple because of his questions and his skepticism. I think we can learn a lot from Thomas. His story speaks into our story. And we can say this about the first picture of Thomas in John's Gospel. Thomas may be pessimistic, yes, but he's willing to go with Jesus even in the face of his fears. It's easy to contrast Thomas' trepidation with the boldness, say, of Peter, who proclaimed to Jesus at his Last Supper, Lord, I am ready to go with you, even if it means going to prison and, and, and dying. But these proved to be words that Peter did not back up with action. However gloomy Thomas's pronouncement, at least Thomas backed his pessimistic words with action as he went with Jesus back to Judea. So even if his attitude needed further adjusting, Thomas was doing what was the most necessary and important thing as a follower of Jesus. Thomas chose to go with Jesus. And that's what being a disciple, then and now, essentially means. It means staying close to Jesus and following his road one step at a time. Even when the way isn't clear, even when we may not feel like walking, we follow Jesus. Discipleship is a journey, and Thomas, like the other first disciples, reminds us that we're all works in progress, but we cannot progress unless we are committed to following him. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a uh, pastor and theologian who was imprisoned by the Nazis and executed at the end of World War II. And he made this observation in his book, The Cost of Discipleship. He said, the believer can neither be a pessimist nor an optimist. Both are an illusion. Believers see life as it is. And against everything and beyond everything they see, they believe in God alone and in his power. They do not believe in the world or in the capability of the world to develop and improve. They do not believe in their own power to improve the world and in their own goodwill. They do not believe in people or, or the good in people that ultimately must triumph. They do not believe in the church in its human power. Rather, he said, believers believe solely in God who creates and does the impossible, who creates life out of death. When the future looks uncertain or fearful, the most important thing we can do is to trust in the Lord who calls us to follow. And we don't follow Jesus because it makes life easier. That is a false gospel. We follow Jesus because he is God. And he is good. And where he leads us, it is good. It may not be easy. In fact, it often is not easy. He calls us to do the difficult things. 
Sometimes we're called to follow him right in the middle of challenges for his sake. The most important decision that you and I can make every single day is to choose consciously and intentionally to follow Jesus. Will we choose to consciously and intentionally live according to his truth in Scripture? Will we consciously and intentionally choose to follow Jesus in ways that reflect his kingdom, even if that means reaching out to a person who is difficult, or if that means repairing a relationship and taking the first step, or if it means proclaiming truth in a pluralistic world that somehow everybody can have their opinion and that's valid except people of faith. God calls us to speak truth into a dark world. And we can, each and every day, we must choose intentionally and consciously to follow Jesus and to choose to obey the leading of the Holy Spirit. And, and what's very important for us and often trips us up is sometimes we may not feel it. We may not always feel really faithful. We may not always feel really happy. There was once a cartoon. I remember uh, a man was in bed with the covers over his head, and his mother is standing there and says, you've got to go to church. And he said, no, I'm not going to church. I don't feel like it today. She goes, you've got to be there. You're the pastor. <laughs> and let me tell you, there have been mornings. There have been mornings where I don't feel like coming up and standing in front of you and proclaim the goodness of God. But discipleship is not about feelings. Discipleship is about faith. It means taking one step in the right direction, one at a time, following Jesus, confident that Jesus is going to lead us, not to a place that is going to be harmful in a way to our souls, but a place that God is leading us to make a difference in this world and to reflect his kingdom one step closer to heaven when all of the sufferings of this world will be past. So lest we get down on Thomas, let's remember that Thomas, along with the other disciples, had already chosen the radical step of following this carpenter from Nazareth. They responded to Jesus' call, come, follow me. And having walked closely with Jesus nearly three years, Thomas knew at some level that as scary as the future might be if he continues walking with Jesus, he can't imagine how scary life will be without Jesus. And so as we go into all the situations ahead of us in life, some undeniably presenting the fear of the unknown, we can walk into the battle knowing that Jesus goes with us in fact, Jesus leads the way and will carry us when we cannot walk on our own. It's no wonder that so often when we gather at the time of illness or death, we turn to those words from Psalm 23, which remind us that the Lord is our shepherd. We are sheep. And the sheep's job is to follow the shepherd. And then there's that wonderful reminder that we repeat again and again as an affirmation of faith. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. And so we come to this table this morning. And we come just as we are, as disciples who are all works in progress. And we come to be strengthened for the journey and to be reminded that we do not walk this path alone and that we have a mighty Savior who goes before us, who walks with us, and will never let us go. And so, come, receive, 
And then from this table, may we go and walk confidently following our good shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ.